is in the news today. I know you're proud that the South Carolina House of Representatives took the first step today towards what I am confident will be a vote to remove the Confederate flag from the grounds of the state capitol in South Carolina, Columbia, South Carolina. And that frames the conversation because it was in 1962, at the height of the civil rights movement, some eight years after the Brown versus the Board of Education decision, that South Carolina made a decision to raise the Confederate flag above its state capitol in what many of us know and understand and believe, which was an act of defiance to the movement for civil rights and integration therein. Those times were times of profound social change. The nation changed in dramatic ways in the period from 1954 to 1968. Along the way, those on the front lines, and they were activists, and they were elected officials. They were activists, of course, like the legendary Dr. Martin Luther King. They were activists like my illustrious predecessor, Whitney Young. They were activists like Dorothy Height. They were men and women at the local level who were on the front lines. Their vision was for a better nation, a better America, for America to turn past its past to a new and exciting future. And those activists, had partners in the elected spectrum in this very capital. Those activists also had partners in the name of presidents, like John F. Kennedy, who introduced in June of 1963 what eventually became in 1964 the Civil Rights Act of 1965, 64. There were presidents like Lyndon Baines Johnson, the Texan, whose political skill and moxie shepherded through the Congress of the United States, the Civil Rights Act of 64 and the Voting Rights Act of 65. And as the movie Selma demonstrated, it took a tremendous moral force and pressure and, and, the death of martyrs by Jimmy Lee Jackson and others. That president, Lyndon Baines Johnson, was not satisfied. And the activist and the nation was not satisfied. But celebratory and joyous about the passage of the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act. President Johnson did something else profound. He laid out, he articulated, he introduced a broad package of economic and social justice legislation called the Great Society. And that legislation, that package included many things. It included things like Head Start, which has and continues to pay dividends. It included things like Job Corps, which has and continues to pay dividends. Pay dividends. And it included the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, which, which President Johnson at that time said was designed and intended to create opportunities for low-income kids and kids of color to have an opportunity to achieve in state and local-run public schools. And it was a compact. It wasn't free money. It wasn't here's the money. Do what you want, whenever you want, however you want. 
wasn't a revenue sharing program, do what you want, however you want, whenever you want. It was a piece of civil rights legislation predicated on the idea that equal education was a cornerstone of the nation's effort to become more equal in the 1960s. And President Johnson led that effort, put that bill into place with broad sweeping majorities in the Congress who supported that effort and nurtured that effort. And since that time, what is now well known as the Elementary Secondary Education Act in its legal terminology has had many names and slogans and iterations and spins. But at its base, at its core, at its basic intention, it is a civil rights bill. Its legacy is in Selma, in Washington, in Albany. Its legacy is the hard work of men and women in those days who had a vision and were willing to fight and fight and fight for a better nation. That is the history of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. I want you to know it because I want you to speak it. I want you to know it because it means it's not any old piece of legislation. It's not just a, quote, general education bill. It precedes the standing up and the creation of the Department of Education. It precedes education experts on the domestic policy staff at the White House. It precedes the creation of many organizations that hold the flame high for its continuation today. It's a historic, essential piece of legislation. For those of us in the historic civil rights community, it is one of many Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act, the Fair Housing Act, the Elementary and Secondary Education Act that were put on the books in the 1960s. Now, we've seen and we have witnessed an assault. We witnessed an assault on the Voting Rights Act, which led to a decision by the court just across the street from here, the Supreme Court, to blow a wide gaping hole in the protections for democracy when it disabled and gutted the preclearance provisions contained in the Voting Rights Act. In other words, they gutted the teeth, took the teeth out, took the accountability out, the Voting Rights Act said, the states, you can do what you want. Now in the Supreme Court, as we sit and speak, we wait. We wait for the Supreme Court to decide whether they are going to buy into a set of arguments that would gut the Fair Housing Act of 1968. Gut it, render it toothless, turn it into a less effective enforcement mechanism against housing discrimination, which sadly still persists and exists in this nation. And thirdly, before us today, and part of the discussion today is whether the Elementary and Secondary Education Act is going to be rendered toothless in terms of ensuring 
accountability and results for low income, poor, disadvantaged, and kids of color. I want to frame it that way because this debate does not sit in isolation of much of what is occurring in this country. This generation cannot be true to what Dr. King worked and died for, what Lyndon Johnson stood for, what Whitney Young strategized about, if it will sit in the stands and in the galleries and watch important pieces of legislation gutted, spayed, neutered, and rendered to us. And the Urban League doesn't care whether the, pol the politicians are doing that. These are ours. Civil rights and equal rights and equal justice is a nonpartisan thing. It's higher than partisanship. It's bigger than red jerseys and blue jerseys. It's bigger than that because it goes to who and what we are and should be as a nation. Are we going to ensure that when the federal government invests in states to help young people achieve, that there's going to be some accountability behind it? And that the accountability system is not going to be whatever the state says it should be. We saw that dance on the Affordable Care Act and the stimulus. States refusing to expand Medicaid, refusing to take stimulus dollars and workforce money and summer jobs money that would benefit. This is an important discussion about how to ensure that these accountabilities. The bill that the Senate passes has some good in it. But it's not enough to say we're going to spend $15 billion a year to do this kind of work. The B-2 Spirit aircraft costs us $2.4 billion a piece. The Baghdad infrastructure rebuilding program is a multi-year, multi-billion dollar commitment to build schools and hospitals and wastewater and water system in Baghdad, in Kandahar. So I'm not going to sit here, I'm not going to stand here and suggest that the, the bill is a bad instrument in total. But it doesn't address many of the things that the leadership of the civil rights communities of this nation have had to confront and have articulated should be in this legislation. Yet we are open to finding a way forward. But any way forward has to have accountability the ability for the Department of Education and the Secretary of Education to involve and intervene. Involve and intervene. Where would we be in the police cases if Eric Holder and Loretta Lynch and the Department of Justice could not intervene and do pattern and practice investigations and collaborative Investigation. Where would we be? Watching and wondering. So I frame this with the idea that we want to have a good conversation today. And acknowledging that there are differences of opinion about what accountability, what the right type of data uh, should look like. But I do know. I do know 
that we will be judged, particularly when we see what is happening across this nation, as to whether we had what it takes to be absolutely consistent with what Lyndon Johnson envisioned in 1965. And what we can't do is allow the hands of time to be flipped and turned backwards, or essential accountability provisions to be rendered useless in these challenging and in these difficult times. So the National Urban League has, of course, aligned and allied itself with many civil rights partners. Uh, in an effort, in an effort uh, to assert our thinking inside of this process. And we will work and we will fight and we will collaborate and we will compromise except on our principles, <coughs> except on what is fundamental, except in these very difficult and challenging times. So it's my honor. Uh, at this time to recognize for remarks and we're 